Okay, so this is the last video in the organic chemistry unit. Here we're going to be talking about some of the things that really tie in the earlier subject. Um, so we've talked about organic compounds, we've talked about functional groups, we've learned how to draw and name those, those uh, compounds, and we've really discussed some of the properties. And now I kind of want to pull it in and talk about some types of these organic molecules. And the main thing here is polymers. So we're going to talk about uh, both synthetic polymers, including plastics, and biological macromolecules, okay? So polymers are just long chains that are made by linking up monomers. And so like here's a monomer, but then there's another, 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 and they keep combining to get a large molecule. Um, now, depending on which classification we're talking about, we can talk about plastics. Guys, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. I cannot tell you everything that is going on with plastics right now. 3D printing, um, you know, making joints and new limbs and, you know, facial reconstruction and, you know, you name it. This is, it's going on in plastics right now. And then there's the biological macromolecules too. So let's go ahead and start with the biological aspects. Some of you guys are going to be going into the medical field and it's kind of nice to really see, oh hey look this is biology. Biology is related to chemistry and so on. So the first type of biological macromolecule I want to talk about are car carbohydrates. Now in biology you guys talk about sugars. Specifically you usually spend a lot of time on monosaccharides which are these little simple molecules like blood sugar, glucose, um, or fructose which is you know everybody's heard of high fructose corn syrup, it's that molecule. Disaccharides are times when you get two things bonded together, you get um, a, a sugar that's a little bit more complex, it takes you a little bit longer to break it down, but then again you get a little bit more energy out of it as well. But the ones that I want to focus on are polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are when you have well over two molecules really bonded together and you get things like cellulose, um, glycogen. These sugars tend to be important for structure, um, specifically for plants and insects. They tend to be like the exoskeleton of insects. Cellulose is the structure of like the leaf plants. Um, energy for us, you know, blood sugar is just glucose. That's a monosaccharide. But when you eat a lot, the way that we store sugar is usually as glycogen. And glycogen is stored um, usually in <sighs> reservoirs for when you are undergoing starving, really. Um, and by starving, I mean hours without food, not, not real uh, long times. So they're also the component of fungal cell walls. They can be signal molecules for biological pathways. Um, you know, if you have a absence of sugar, sometimes that can signal things, just like an overabundance of uh, sugar can signal a pathway to kind of get you to store things, okay? So lipids are uh, fat molecules. They typically have this really long hydrocarbon chain, and then they are attached to a carboxylic acid group. Now, uh, this fatty acid can be sit, com combined with a glycerol, and you end up getting um, a triglyceride, or it's um, a little bit more, I want to say complex, I guess. And so you end up having this polar side group, and then you also have this nonpolar chain, which is going to have implications for how it reacts in the body as well as um, how we store it. So for example, if it's saturated, you know, there's really not much that we can do there. We could, I guess, substitute things, but it's really hard to break apart those fats, which is why we typically want unsaturated, usually poly unsaturated fats. And if we had to choose, we would choose the cis fats because the cis fats are gonna be um, long chains on the same side. See the C shape here? 
it's going to allow a nucleophilic attack to come in. We can break apart those those fats. We can use them for energy and other things. Whereas if you have a trans fat, something like this, it's kind of hard to get around these bulky side chains to break it apart. So lipids were, are going to provide energy. They provide insulation. Um, you know, the more fat you have, the less cold you are. My sister is, I swear she weighs like 90 pounds and she's always freezing. It's also going to be storage of fatty acids. Guys, fatty acids are like the highest energy component you can get. They're the structure of cell membranes. Um, so as we're talking about a cell membrane, you know, the lipids kind of function like this. They are going to be what allow molecules to come through or not. They allow signal molecules to travel along the membrane or not. So they ensure membrane fluidity. Um, they dissolve fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin E, vitamin D, vitamin A. If, you know, you take a daily vitamin, vitamin C, your B vitamins, those only stay in your body for a few hours and then you typically, you know, urinate them out. Um, but the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and E, you typically hang on to them for a lot longer. And the way you do that is it stays inside a fat deposit, okay? Now, because lipids are along the surface of your membrane, they also act in house as receptors. And so they can kind of tell when something needs to come in or not. I don't know. Go away. There we go. Um, so proteins are the next uh, polymer I want to talk about. These are polymers of amino acids. Now if you've taken biology, there's a little over 20 amino acids that you guys typically talk about, but really there's even more um, that you don't talk about that aren't necessarily as useful for us. And the way an amino acid works is you have an amine group, a carboxylic acid group, and so an amino acid, and then a side chain. And that side chain is going to depend, determine like how the amino acid functions. Um, but anyway, the amino acid, the amine group from one amino acid, the carboxylic acid from another amino acid bond together and you get an amide or a peptide bond. Now, we can talk about the different layers, levels of proteins, but the idea is it's not just a long chain here. It tends to, after you have that long chain, they fold into a specific orientation that is going to have an overall structure. Go away. And then um, once you have the overall structure, it's going to interact with other proteins. And the way biologists love to draw this is as like a Miss Pac-Man and it's like, oh, this protein's acting and, you know, here's this, you know, thing that it's chewing on or functioning on and it just um, is an oversimplified uh, thing, but it's, you know, good. So proteins do almost everything. They repair our body tissues. Um, they regulate our growth and processes. They act as catalysts, you know, because they are um, involved in pretty much every cellular reaction. They are signal molecules, they are hormones, they help our structure by keeping um, the cell uh, the specific size. They actually will regulate the size of the cell. They tell the, the cell when to stop growing. Um, and then they can also be recycled for essential amino acids. So if you eat, you know, a steak or something, um, that gets broken down and you can kind of harvest the amino acids from the food and send it to the body. Uh, parts of your body where you need that. Nucleic acids are probably the one that everyone loves to talk about the most. These are polymers of nucleotides. And so you have these um, ring structured bases and they will form a polymer that holds genetic information. You know, um, more important than that though, they actually do a ton. Um, ATP is involved. It provides energy for almost everything. Um, the citric acid cycle and 
electron transport chain, you end up getting so many ATP molecules out of here because harvesting energy from ATP is so massively important. Um, they can also function as cell signal molecules for reactions. If you have too much GTP, it turns off processes. If you, turn, if you have not enough, it also signals the start as well. So that's kind of it for like a review for um, biological polymers. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on plastics just because they tend to be the things that you guys are less comfortable with even though you use them on a daily basis. And I just want to kind of talk about them. So thermoplastics, um, there's four ways that you can really have um, a polymer. A thermoplastic is made while it's heated, but when it settles into a solid, it tends to be um, a little bit firmer. You can reheat and cool thermoplastics kind of often. I forget how many times, but more than once. Thermosets, once you've heated them and put them into the shape, um, they kind of, you can't do much with them. It's kind of like um, the lid of jug bottles and things like that. Um, they're a little less recyclable. Elastomers tend to be elastic. They can replace things like rubber. <clears throat> and then there's synthetic fibers from like plant and animal fibers that you can use, things like nylon. So these polymers are mostly made from petroleum products. Um, they are less expensive. than biopolymers, but they're not as environmentally friendly. So we typically use plastic because it's cheap and we worry about recycling later, which, you know, is an issue. Because they're made from hydrocarbons, they tend to be hydrophobic, meaning they don't interact with water. There are a few different ones that I want to talk about. Low density polyethylene is probably the most common polymer. It was the first to be made, and because of that, it ends up being um, still kind of like the go-to. And so the reason this is, is you have ethene, and what happens is ethene um, has this double bond. You know, here's your hydrogens. And so what can happen is this double bond comes over, and it bonds to another one. And so then you end up getting, you know, single bond ethylene um, things. And so there, it's a thermoplastic and it's going to be moldable and flexible. You guys ex touch this stuff all the time. Um, plastic food containers, sometimes playground equipment, plastic wrap, um, food trays, specifically like, um, you know, the Tupperware, um, sometimes like the kids' plates that are reusable, that kind of thing. Uh, water bottles, six-pack rings, you name it. Depending on how thick it is, it gets a little bit less uh, flexible. But you get the idea. This is something that you are, um, you know, familiar with. So the high-density version of this, here you have um, more of the molecules together. So it's going to be stronger because there's going to be less branching involved. Go away. I don't know how to make that go away. This is going to be more for like the bottle caps, the fuel tanks. Again, flexible, but not really. Um, electrical and toolboxes, you know, if you've got like those um, really strong plastic toolboxes, um, you get the idea. Folding chairs, folding tables, like from Walmart. I'm actually sitting next to one of those right now. Plastic bags, um, you know, they're flexible because they can tear, but they're also um, relatively strong, okay? So that's strong is what I want to talk about. Milk jugs, this is also can be used in bone reconstruction, specifically, um, I don't think this is the facial reconstruction one, but it is hard enough that when you put it in like where a broken bone was or you know something it can be used that way. Polypropylene is probably the one that is used in lab the most. Um, it's chemically resistant. So again you have propane, propane um, and then what happens is this double bond comes out and it bonds to this guy and so you end up getting a really long uh, chain and sometimes you have some branching as well. 
It's the second most common polymer because it's, you know, really cheap and it's also, you know, able to withstand quite a bit of use. Um, and then uh, it can be used in automotive industry because, you know, it's, you know, you can use it as like, um, oh, what's the thing called? It's a hard plastic. You can use it there. Um, it can also be used in lab equipment, things like centrifuge tubes, um, test tubes, pipettes, because it's not going to disintegrate with, um, with, it's not going to disintegrate with exposure to acids or bases. Polyvinyl chloride or PVC. PVC pipe is pretty common um, in terms of being used for like construction. It's also kind of chemically resistant. It's a, um, if you've ever been in like Home Depot, it's that white pipe, you know. Um, it's rugged, but it can be made softer if you add some uh, plasticizers with it. So you can use it in clothing, you can use it in upholstery. I know it's used in upholstery pretty often actually. Um, you can put it into like an electrical cable insula insulation because it's going to keep out water, it's going to keep out some of the uh, the things that would you know mess with electricity. It can also be used in inflatable products when you add in the elasticizers and it can also kind of replace rubber in a few in, uh, things. Um, not quite in tires yet, but getting there. Polystyrene, um, again, you can kind of tell that a lot of these are thermoplastics. Here we've got a colorless solid. It's going to be really stable. It doesn't degrade very fast, which unfortunately means it's kind of a good, it sticks yeah. around. It's a part of litter. Um, and then it's used in plastic cutlery, um, plastic models, DVD cases, packing materials all of these things that typically you don't know what to do with when you're done. What do you do with packing materials? What do you do with the plastic forks that you use at the cafeteria? Typically it goes in the trash. It's a problem that way. Styrene is this circular molecule, this aromatic, and so you typically have um, the aromatic molecule sticking up and below. And it can, you know, interact with more side chains up here, but it's, you know, pretty common. Nylon has been used for a long time. Uh, probably this is a picture from the 50s um, with nylon stockings. Um, it's used in clothing, it's used in flooring, food packaging because it's hydro, uh, its backbone is hydrophilic. Um, it's able to kind of, um, it, it can be like a mesh almost. It also has an polyamide, which is, um, Really interesting. Teflon is another one you guys are in having have seen quite a bit. Probably the most common right now that you've seen is the Teflon coating on cookware. Um, it is a pretty solid non-stick surface because it's you know hydrophobic, but then it can also be used as a lubricant. When I was in lab, we would put Teflon um, coatings on some of the bearings because it would allow for um, the machine parts to move without com grinding against each other. Uh, graft material, it can be used on coating, it's used in catheters, it's used in a lot of places because it is not reactive and it can be antibacterial. So it's really kind of um, all over the place. Polyurethane, um, if you've ever you know, again, been to Home Depot, um, urethane is kind of a, a hydrophobic layer. It's elastic, it's transparent, it's resistant to all kinds of chemicals. It's also resistant to abrasion. You can actually use it as a coating on like floors, tables, um, cell phones, keyboards. It can also be used because it's so hard in power tools, it can be used in footwear, film. Um, it's another way that uh, it just stays uh, really a good resistant layer. Now, technically, it's hydrophobic, but once it dries, I mean, your cell phone doesn't soak up water. Um, 
that kind of thing. It, it's just a different property when it's dry. So in terms of organic compounds, we have looked at how to recognize the different classifications. We've learned how to name them. We've looked at cis trans isomers. We've talked about the properties of functional groups. And then we've really gotten into some of the macromolecules and um, synthetic polymers that you guys use all the time. And so I just kind of wanted to pull all that back in together as you move forward into your homework.